Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, as my title suggests, I am going to talk about leveraging racially mixed populations to scientific advantage to identify new risk factors for asthma and drug response. And by racially mixed, I'm talking about particularly minority children. But this is not this is a not just a U.S. phenomenon. It's worldwide. So what does it mean to be Asian? What does it mean to be South Asian? What does it mean to be European? Those are all racially mixed. And what we're doing is taking modern advances in genetic technology and applying them to common diseases. And the disease that we study is in children. So I'm going to begin by a little background. And so why should you really care? Well, the demographics of the United States are changing. And this slide illustrates the demographics of the U.S. Um, population as of 2015. How you should look at this, and if you are a politician whose job is on the line based on their constituents, this is who's paying your salary. This is who funds the FDA. This is who funds the NIH. Currently, as of today, 2016, March 15, Every child that formed the likelihood of being a minority is higher than it is to be a non-minority population. So in essence, we have what's called a minority majority, in that 47% of the current US population is not white. That's who's generating the dollars that pay for the FDA and the NIH. Well, this is very important, because when we looked at modern genetic studies, what we call genome-wide associations, we found this, 96% of all contemporary modern genetic studies have been done in white populations or populations of European descent. This is a paper that I published with my colleagues, Carlos Bustamante from Stanford University, Francisco de la Vega. We published this in Nature in 2011. And this is shocking because it's not only a social disparity, but it is a myth scientific opportunity to identify novel risk factors. So I'm going to talk about precision medicine. So let me describe what precision medicine means to me. And this, this definition is slightly different than what we used on President Obama's precision medicine initiative. But I'm a basic scientist, and I look at clinical outcomes. And so this is what it means to me. How do we use genes to help determine our risks for disease as well as response to therapies. So let me give you a hypothetical situation. Here's a question that you should read and ask yourself. If your doctor prescribed to you, say patient Sherman Chow, a pill to treat a heart attack, would you take it if you knew that there's a possibility that it didn't work? Well, think about that. Well, actually, it's a problem. Because this is exactly what happened. And the Attorney General of Hawaii sued Bristol Myers Squibb in a David versus Goliath case. And these are the headlines that you saw. This is from 2014. Essentially, Plavix is a prodrug, which means that it needs to be activated to its active form. 50% of Asians, 65% of Pacific Islanders don't carry the polymorphism to make that drug active. Bristol-Myers Squibb and their genius marketing were able to get it on Medicare formulary and were able to get that to be the drug du jour for all Hawaiians if you had a heart attack. So imagine you're Sherman Chow, you're on vacation in Hawaii or you're a native citizen, you have a heart attack, you go to the ER, basically the likelihood of you getting a placebo is high. And this is what happened when, when that happens. David Louie, the Attorney General, took uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb to court as well as Sanofi of Venice. The, the trial is still pending, so I can't tell you much information. And this is what the lawsuit contends, is that Bristol Myers Squibb had disengorgement of profits for deceptive and unfair marketing practices related to their blockbuster antiplatelet drug, Plavix. So what do we do about asthma? The FDA has, in the last 15 years, and this is data that I found yesterday, so I did a, a search yesterday of how the FDA has done in the last 15 years. 
is essentially in the last 15 years, there have been two novel asthma drugs. Two, uh, and this is what the scorecard looks for, all respiratory drugs. Out of 66 approved by the FDA since 2000, nine were for asthma, two were novel, seven of the nine were reformulations of existing drugs, new packaging, so probably to extend the, uh, the patent, so to speak. Going back to the Bristol-Myers Squibb approach, they published this report yesterday. So these data are hot off the press. Bristol-Myers Squibb said, to hell with you guys. We're not going to buy into this precision medicine stuff. We prefer to treat the masses, run the risk of having patients like the Hawaiians have heart attacks. Good luck suing them. And that's what they're saying that with this particular article that came out yesterday. Is everything okay with the, the background? Excuse me, I'm hearing background noises here. Are we okay? Is everything okay? Yes? Okay. So going back to the pulmonary stuff, one of the important aspects of our job is since we look at minority populations, we ask what was the scorecard, so to speak, with respect to the NIH funding? As you might remember, but I'll remind you, in 1993, Congress passed a law requiring the NIH to include women and minorities in all NIH-funded research. So being a scientist, what we did is we focused our scientific abilities onto the NIH itself. And we just asked, what does the scorecard say? What this slide depicts is on the y-axis, we had the percent of all participants in any clinical trial funded by the NIH going from 1993 to 2013, 20 year history. In the 20 years of taxpayers funded dollars, less than 5% of all NIH focused research on pulmonary disease has included non-minority populations. Less than 5%. That means 95% of tax dollars which are funded by 47% of the U.S. populations, which is not minority, are not deriving scientific benefit from what they're paying into. This is, again, a social travesty, but it's also a missed scientific opportunity to identify new drugs, new targets. So and then we started digging in a little bit deeper. Well, who's likely to do research in minority populations? it tends to be minority scientists. So we said, well, how are minority scientists doing? And by minority, we mean anyone non-European. So this actually includes Asians. So when Asian PIs, non-minority PIs, or when minority PIs applied for R01 funding, which is the gold standard of uh, true NIH merit, we said, how do they fare in the NIH review process? And this is what we found. We use Freedom of Information Act information, uh, FOIA, going back 30 years. And what you can see on this left graph is in red are R01 applications by white investigators. In turquoise are R01 applications by non-white. This includes Asians. There's a very small percentage of minority applicants considered African Americans, Hispanic, and Native Americans. The bulk of these are Asians. But what you can see is a very stark but consistent 30-year trend that non-white R01 applicants are consistently underfunded relative to their white peers. So it's almost a double-edged sword. We, we deem uh, this a meritocracy of being able to get R01 funding, but when you apply to the, R, to the NIH for R01 funding, which is likely mean that you're probably going to study minority populations or the, po or the groups that study minority populations the most, they have a double hit in that it's less likely that they'll be funded. When we looked at study section compositions relative to the population, the U.S. population, again, which is 47% non-white, which is a dotted hashed line on the horizontal axis, in turquoise, we see the number of non-white reviewers. So, I wrestled in college. I was always taught to work hard. You work hard, you might win. 
we always taught that this is a meritocracy, but what you can see by the data, it is not a meritocracy. So the field is not leveled. And this is something that has implications for the FDA, has implications for all biomedical and clinical science. This is not just something that, that we're yelling out in the, in the forest. This is a, a topic that was picked up by the journal Science. It was picked up by Nature in December of 2015, picked up by NPR, and recently picked up by Congress. So that's the social aspects of what we do. Remember, I'm a physician scientist. I'm trained in basic science. So I'm going to shift my topic to hardcore basic sciences, which, which is what I was trained in. So a big component of what we do, and I've been blessed to have a wonderful education and be at a wonderful university like UCSF, but one of our jobs is to be to make sure that precision medicine is socially precise. We cannot continue to do the same old, same old, and I don't think that the FDA should just rubber stamp existing clinical trials in the way we've done in the last 30 years because we get those terrible results that I just alluded to with the Plavix. So I study asthma. I'm trained in pulmonary medicine. Asthma is the most common chronic disease of children. It's an inflammatory disorder of the airways. It causes the airway tick thickening and tightening. And what you see on the top graph here is you see a widely patent airway where um, like a garden hose size tube where you can breathe in and out without a problem. When you have periodic inflammation, at least a narrowing of the airway, if you have severe inflammation, it leads to extreme constriction of the airway. Imagine trying to breathe through a snorkel versus trying to breathe through a straw. It, it is difficult. It can cause death. It causes, it's one of the number one causes of morbidity in the United States amongst children. But what's fascinating to us is that there are tremendous racial disparities with respect to asthma prevalence, morbidity, and mortality in the United States. We published this this past uh, year in 2016, and we came up with a uh, disparity ratio in which we looked at common diseases, so like diabetes, obesity, coronary heart disease, emphysema slash COPD, and asthma. And basically what we did is we looked at the pop within asthma, the populations with the highest prevalence and divided by the population with the lowest prevalence. There we came up with a, what we call a disparity ratio. And you can see that for the number of individuals, U.S. citizens that are affected in the number of millions, the disparity ratio for asthma is highest. This highlights and underscores the importance of studying this particular disease. Here's another way to look at these data. In the U.S., the population with the highest prevalence are African Americans and Puerto Rican populations. The populations with the lowest prevalence are Mexican Americans. Asthma prevalence, like any disease, is difficult to really assess because of the potential for what we call disease misclassification. On the right side of this graph is mortality rate. You're either dead or you're not, and what you see is the mortality rates for children with asthma near the prevalence rates. So what we're trying to do in my lab is trying to tease apart what proportion of this is explained by genetic factors versus environmental factors. And this is, we know, being a, a trained physician, practicing physician, being trained in pulmonary epidemiology and being an epidemiologist as well as a genetic epidemiologist, I recognize that there are myriad of factors that cause this common chronic disease. There are social factors, there are environmental factors like air pollution, socioeconomic factors, stress, as well as genetic factors. And what we try to do is we try to, to set out to address this, this question. To me, is a tremendous conundrum. And how do we tackle this? And one of the things that we did is we went out and built our own. We recruited 10,000 minority participants from all over the United States. And what this graph demonstrates is the distribution of all of our clinical centers throughout the United States. For those of you that are physicians out there or young trainees or have children that are interested in medicine, I want you to know that this is a project that I started when I was a medical resident back at Harvard in 1998. 
I continued with it for the last, uh, up until now, for the last 25 years that, that this has been in existence. It's taken me 25 years to get to this point, but we're still making significant progress. Here's what we did. In each of these, what we did in each of the clinical sites that I showed you here, we brought in children with and without asthma. We brought them into a clinic. We asked them detailed information about asthma. We had them all perform what's called spirometry, where we had them breathe in and out of a machine. We can measure how tight the airways are. We gave them albuterol, which is the most commonly prescribed asthma medication in the world. We got detailed medical history. We got genetic information. We got measures of uh, serologic coatening. We have DNA methylation. We have RNA. We have very detailed measures of air pollution and socioeconomic factors as well as discrimination. On every single kid, whether they had asthma or not, we got geocoded measures of air pollution from the time of birth every year to the time of recruitment. So essentially what we have in, in 8,500 minority children, the largest study of asthma in children in the United States, we have vertical phenotyping. And this is great because what, we can, what it allows us to do is to overlay genetics on top of social, social demographic, environmental effects, as well as geographic and air pollution effects. No other study in the United States can do this in minority children. And this is something that I'm very proud of, and it's something that we've worked really hard to do. One of the important things that we do is we are paid to play ball. We are paid to collaborate, and so our lab is called the UCSF Asthma Collaboratory. Collaboration, laboratory. The key requisite to participate with us is, number one, you have to be smart. Number two, you have to be nice and be willing to interact with us as a team. And again, we focus on populations that have been largely excluded or understudied by the NIH, which is tax supported. We've had several successes, and I'm just going to highlight some of them here before I go into the hardcore science that we do. We published in a New England journal. We retooled the definition of lung disease by using genetic ancestry. We demonstrated that socioeconomic factors influence risk of disease and modify severity of disease. We also identified ethnic specific genetic variants that were risk factors not only for asthma, for, but for differences in drug response. So let me diverge a little bit, digress, and talk about what does it mean to be racially mixed. And I'm going to focus in on African Americans and Hispanics, but this is relevant for Indian populations, it's relevant for European populations, it's relevant for Asian populations. But something really unique happened in 1492 when Christopher Columbus set sail from Spain. He left, he left Europe, came to the New World, shown here with the blue lines or the turquoise lines. Native Americans were here. Subsequent to that was the forced importation of African slaves, shown here by the yellow lines. And so what happened is, the contemporary population in 2016, shown here, what we call it, racially admixed. Uh, and I'm sorry if anyone's colorblind, but what each of these cartoon characters at the bottom of the slide demonstrates is that there are different colors. So some individuals have more green, reflecting African ancestry. Some individuals have more yellow, representing European ancestry. Some individuals have more purple representing Native American ancestry. But really, each one of us, you, me, our family, we're all mutts, but we're all descendants of thousands of years of ancestral mixing before. Now, this is a cartoon, and it's really important to get that when we can now use genetic measures to quantitatively measure this. Let me give you a perfect example. I am positive that everyone in the audience has watched CSI or some iteration of that crime movie in which a forensic pathologist identifies or 
uh, an investigator identify blood in the wall. They take a swab of blood. They do genetic testing, and they tell the police officer there's a 90% likelihood that this person is Asian, 10% likelihood the person is European. You can go online now to 23, uh, 23andMe or Ancestry.com and use genetic markers to estimate your true ancestry. And this is exactly what we did. And here we have three tables. On the top, we have African Americans. In the middle one, we have Mexicans. We have Puerto Ricans on the bottom. Each vertical bar represents an individual. Each individual to get recruited into our study had to self-identify themselves, their parents, and their biologic grandparents as being 100% pure Mexican, African, or Puerto Rican. And what you see, if we just looked at the, the bottom graph, going from left to right, individual number one is part yellow, part green, part purple, so meaning part European, part African, and part Native American. When you move to individual way on the right, they're mostly European, a little bit African, and a little bit Native American. Now me, I'm Hispanic, I'm genetically mixed, I'm 26% Native American, 4% African, and the rest is European. But it really doesn't matter what my global ancestry is or what I think my self-identified ethnicity is. What really matters is what my ancestry is at a particular gene. So if we're studying diabetes, do you care what my ancestry is? Or do you care what the genetic ancestry is of my insulin gene? Because we know that Native Americans had a higher, have a higher risk of diabetes than Europeans. So perhaps the alteration of Native American versus European is important. So let me give you a perfect example of what someone might look like on their karyotype. This is a karyotype, is all your chromosomes, a photograph of your chromosomes lined up just like this. We get 23 from mom, 23 from dad. Here we have just 23, pair, uh, 23 pairs. And here on chromosome 1, the far left top, we might have large chunks of Native American, European, and African ancestry. So how do we leverage that to scientific advantage? And this is really cool. We know for sure in medicine that multiple sclerosis, debilitating neurologic inflammatory disorder, happens in Europeans almost exclusively. However, Montel Williams, the African-American talk show host, had it. So if you believe that multiple sclerosis is due to a European genetic risk factor, a potentially good population to study would be African Americans. Why? Because on average in the United States, African Americans are 80% African, 20% European. What this slide, this cartoon shows, is a cartoon of what an average African American might look like. Green depicts the African ancestry, yellow depicts the European ancestry, and I try to match it so it's 80 20 pr proportions. So if you're a gene hunter for the MS gene, multiple sclerosis gene, it'd be great to go after African Americans because a priori, you could systematically exclude 80% of the genome and just focus in on the 20% that's European in origin. Well, UCSF started doing that study led by Steve Hauser and Jorge Oxenberg. They went out, they got funded, they went out to African American communities and that study flopped, failed miserably. It wasn't until they did it properly and got on with Montel Williams, who's a talk show host, Montel said, got on his show and said, if you're African American, you're a brother or sister, and you got MS, send your DNA to UCSF. They went ahead, we built at UCSF right across the street from where I'm speaking, built the largest study of African Americans with multiple sclerosis in the United States. They assigned ancestry at every region of the genome, and guess what they found? Boom. On chromosome one, every African American that had multiple sclerosis inherited a European segment right at chromosome one. Where we're going now, where they're going now, since I'm not part of the study, they're fine mapping that, uh, that region, and with the advent of whole genome sequencing, they're getting 
closer and closer to identifying the exact chromosomal address of the disease-causing gene for MS in African Americans. This is a perfect example of what we are trying to do for asthma as well as drug response. We've done this already for our Hispanic and African American populations, and this is just a brief scorecard of what we've done. We've demonstrated on chromosome 6 that on the P-arm that if you had Native American ancestry, you had lower IgE levels or immunoglobin E levels amongst all children with asthma. On the long arm of chromosome 6, if you have inherited African ancestry and were Mexican, it was protective against the development of asthma. Again, on chromosome 8, if you have inherited the American ancestry at that particular region, it increases your risk of asthma. And we just published a paper in Nature Communications showing that on chromosome 6, on the long arm, if you have inherited Native American ancestry at that particular region, it lowers your risk for developing breast cancer in Latinas. Again, so we're making significant inroads, and this is a cartoon of what a single chromosome might look like. So going back to our original study design, what separates us from everybody that says they got a million patients through these electronic health records is our ability to actually put our hands on patients. We brought every single kid in our, in our study into the clinic, and here's an example of a child Puerto Rican child breathing through what we call a spirometer. It's hard to see, but the child has a nose clip, and he's breathing into a tube, and it's a closed-loop system. So anyone who has asthma will know that this is a, on the top we have exhalation, and on the bottom we have inspiration. In each of these situations, we have them do spirometry before and after the administration of albuterol. All right, this is the money slide. This separates us from Kaiser, Geisinger, and everyone that's a million people in an electronic health record. The difference with the electronic health record is those are cursory and coarse data I wouldn't bet your life on. But these are data in which we put our hands on patients. We had them actually perform a clinical test. We gave them the drugs. We have quantitative measure of drug response, or what we're calling bronchodilator drug use, or BDR. And that's important for the rest of our study. One of the first papers that we ever published was this slide here. On the y-axis, I have drug response. I have two groups of children, those under the age of 16 on the left, those greater than the age of 16 on the right. Those Mexicans shown in yellow, Puerto Ricans shown in red, remember those two groups? are on the ends of the asthma prevalence as well as mortality spectrum. And what we saw is no matter how we looked at the data, whether we adjusted for medications, slides or dice data, the strongest predictor of albuterol response was ethnic background. The population with the highest asthma prevalence, highest asthma death rates, also had the lowest drug response. So, we published this in 2004. One of the co comments that we got was, well, there could be disease misclassification because you took all comers, meaning you had people with mild versus severe disease. So how does it look when you have a cherry-picked population of kids with severe disease? A young undergraduate by the name of Marion Nockby, who's a surgeon now at Harvard, published this paper. Again, on the y-axis, we have drug response. The higher you are, the better. We have three racial groups with moderate to severe disease. So these are kids who for sure have asthma. The dotted line at 12% is where we as a physician or as medical society say that you've had a clinically good response. And again, what we saw is that the population with the highest asthma prevalence, the highest asthma mortality rates, had the lowest bronchodilator drug response. Well, this is work that we published. One, we published the first paper in 1997. We published the follow-up in 2003. We published this one in 2007. I thought we were all alone studying this. But lo and behold, Alexa Smith Klein doing the same thing. They went ahead and published their results, and this is what they showed. 
And this is the black box warning of the package insert. If any of you have seen a package insert, it's one of the first things that we throw away. But if you actually took the time to read it, this is what it would say. Amongst, this is for Saravent, amongst African Americans, asthma-related deaths occurred at a higher rate in patients treated with Saravent than those treated with placebo with a relative risk of 7.26. That is pretty damn high. And if you were going to Las Vegas, those would be day nods. But what kind of parent would you be to let your son or daughter take that medication knowing full well that an increased risk of death? In fact, there was a back-to-back, -back, an editorial that came out this past week talking about Cerevent and the risk of adverse reactions in patients with asthma. Here's where we're going off the grid now, and I'm about to present to you data that has never been shown before and is still is not published, but is something that's very exciting. It's probably the best project that we got going on in our lab. We are funded by the National Institutes of Health and in collaboration with UCSF and the New York Genome Center to perform whole genome sequencing of drug response in minority populations. We have a total of 1,500 individuals, 500 from each racial group. 500 African Americans, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, again, on the extremes of asthma prevalence, on the extremes of asthma mortality. Here's what we did is we took high and low responders, shown here in this histogram from three racial groups, African, Puerto Ricans, and Mexicans. And this is being led by uh, two stars in my group, Angel Mock, who's there on the left, Marquita White, uh, who is a statistical genetics postdoc in my lab, and, and Zach Speech, who's also a postdoc in Ryan Hernandez's lab. And behind the scenes, we have Sam O, oh, who's a lead epidemiologist for our group. So we picked high and low responders, so the extreme phenotypes. And essentially what we did is we performed, we performed whole genome sequencing, and these are the results. In each individual, we found about, on average, 66 million genetic variants. It's a computational nightmare. As you can expect, African Americans have the highest genetic diversity, so they have the most novel genetic variants shown far on the right. Puerto Ricans have a substantial amount of African ancestry, so they're intermediate. Mexicans have lower African ancestry, so they're on the lower end. Mexican Americans tend to have more Native American ancestry. And so this is kind of neat. So here's what we did. We looked at bronchodilator response, and that's our model, looking at genetic variants, age, sex, obesity, or what we call uh, body mass index, BMI, and we used global estimates of genetic ancestry. We did two uh, essential tests. We looked at individual effects of genetic variants, as well as combined effects, where we lumped single rare variants together to have one impact score in our analysis. And essentially, what I'm about to present to you are three different approaches, and what we're trying to do is find convergence in the sweet spot. Number one, using whole genome sequencing data, we're going to look at common variants. Number two, we're going to look at rare variants that tend to be found only in one population, say Asians, and not found in other populations. A good example of that is Duffy. The Duffy Null allele is only found in populations of sub-Saharan Africa. It's not found outside of Africa. And then we're going to leverage the genetic ancestry at every single point in the genome to identify novel ethnic-specific risk factors. So again, we have three distinct but complementary statistical methods, and we're trying to find convergence. Here's the results of the first analysis of common variants. This is what's called a Manhattan plot. Each vertical bar, shown by red and blue, represents a chromosome. The red horizontal line represents where the traditional genome-wide statistically significant threshold is for multiple testing. And what we see is on chromosome 5, as we see a peak 
that meets genome-wide significance at the accepted gold standard of 10 to the minus 8, and it has a significant odds ratio of 1.62. When we looked at rare variants, we found something unique. Puerto Ricans are on top, African Americans are intermediate, Mexicans are on the bottom. We found that there are rare variants in Puerto Ricans that were not found in other populations. We found that there are rare variants in African Americans that were not found in Mexican populations. So on the far right, some of the rare variants have popped up in genes that have been previously implicated in dis lung disease. So this is a nice validation of our approach. And then here's one uh, example of what admixture mapping looks like. Here is one particular plot, one graph for Puerto Rican individuals, and we showed that on chromosome 1, an excess of Native American ancestry on chromosome 1 is associated with increased risk of developing asthma among Puerto Ricans. When we looked at that peak, that ancestral peak on chromosome 1, we found a variety of genes, CD2, CD58, SLC, VAG, these are all genes that have been previously implicated in lung disease that are also popping up on our admixture mapping screen. And that is unique. So we took three approaches to identify convergence of these particular genes. I'm showing you seven particular genes on this slide here. And each of these genes has been previously implicated in other pulmonary related phenotypes. So if we go from left to right, we have a DNH5 associated with lung capacity, emphysema. We had a FOXK1, the SLC, associated with inhaled corticosteroids, bronchodilator response. On the third level, we have FHL2, KCNNS3, Dango1, all associated with what we call airway hyperresponsiveness. And on the far right, we have CD2 and CD58, also associated with T cell stimulation. So we're coming near the hour, so I'm going to wrap this up. But in summary, we've built the largest pediatric study of asthma and pharmacogenetics in minority children in the United States. We have 10,000 children. We have the most comprehensive and vertically integrated clinical, environmental, social, as well as genetic data. Using this approach, a project that I started in 1998 and have continued up until 2016, we have clearly identified that there are racial differences in drug response. Not only us, but again, going back to the plastic example and Hawaii lawsuit against Bristol Myers Squibb, it's very clear that we need to look at racially diverse populations when we do clinical studies. Currently, there are about 100 FDA labels considering race and drugs in the, all the FDA portfolio. Moreover, what we've demonstrated is by using this novel technique, whole genome sequencing, we've been able to move the ball down the field, so to speak, and build upon the existing genome-wide association studies to identify novel, ethnic-specific, genetic as well as pharmacogenetic associations that we would not have identified with the genome-wide association study arrays alone. So even though I get to speak in this beautiful webinar, I am standing on the shoulders of many giants who have done a lot of the work. This particular whole genome sequencing project is being led by two individuals in my group, Angel Mock and Marquita White, and Zach Speech from Ryan Hernandez's group, with help from a variety of clinical, statistical, genetic collaborators here at UCSF, and our partners at Crime the New York Genome Center in New York. And finally, the, the institution that makes the, gives, the, uh, gives us the fuel to go is the NHLBI through their top meta program. I'm going to wrap it up there. Again, I'd like to let my hair down and, and have this be an open session for free questions regarding anything. Thank you again for the, your attention. It has been a privilege and honor to speak. Thank you.
If anyone has any questions that's watching remotely, please type it in the chat box, and Dr. Um, Burchard can see that. And if anyone has any questions here in the room, please come up and ask them or the microphone. No. Uh, Thank you. It was a wonderful lecture. Really, really Thank fascinating. You. Yeah, can you hear me, uh, Dr. Bashad? Yes, now I can. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you a question. I mean, some of the things that you got, you know, with the ability to do kinetics, sometimes, you know, you get, sometimes you get carried away with it and stuff like that. And I think, you know, it's important to tie pharmacology to genetics, and that's what, you know, the, the two, you know, CYP, C19 enzyme, you know, with plavix, it's important to know and, and, and to track that and, and, and things like that. The other thing on a couple of your things, like, um, with multiple sclerosis, I mean, it seems to be a disease of the north, but it seems to be some environmental factors, some strong environmental factors there, too, because people, you know, born in Hawaii, if they live there for a certain amount of years, they don't seem to ever get multiple sclerosis and things like that, even if they're of a European extraction. Uh, the other thing with asthma, the microbiome has become, you know, really, seems to be really important and stuff like that. So I, I was just wondering where you're going in that direction as, as far as, and again, uh, I mean, diet and things like that. The, I mean, you know, I've been weight with a different microbiome, and uh, I've been trying to find that. But uh, you know, but uh, you know, but I, I was just wondering where you're going with that, or if you have. Yeah, uh, we have all the data, but um, um, despite the wealth of our data, the large size of our data, uh, I had an 0 and 11 streak at the NIH. So 11 R01 applications, zero funded. So. Um, it's nice, and I hear your point, it's valid, but if the NIH is not going to fund it, and that's partly what prompted me to look at whether or not it was a true meritocracy, and I don't think it is, and I voiced my opinion to Francis Collins and Congress about that. Um, so if we can get funded, we study it because we have the data. No, no, I mean, I'm not coming. I mean, NIH funding is, you know, you know it's always uh, a mystery, you know, but, uh, yeah. No, it's tax-supported dollars and should be funded out meritoriously. So I have strong opinions about that, if you couldn't tell. Well, thank you for your opinions. This is Frank Weichold. Um, question, you know, basically you gave us some taste of a approach to uh, pin down, and we learned that one of the big challenges that you see is a lack of funding, and certainly as uh, being part of FDA, uh, we have uh, significant interest in stimulating funding, but also uh, research in the right direction. Uh, what do you see as the largest challenges in addition to the funding that, you know, federal uh, agencies and the federal government certainly will play a significant role and have to play a significant role in order to uh, continue to support academic development? But um, we also need to be open-minded towards other stakeholders for sure. And I'm sure Stanford uh, is a good example for uh, leveraging that in an entrepreneurial way. But in addition yeah. to this uh, data crunching challenge, what do you see are the biggest challenges in the field of precision medicine from your perspective in your particular area? Well, um, you know, putting all the, the social justice stuff aside on a scientific basis, I worry, and I know that the FDA is worried about this, that when we do clinical trials in other countries, whether they be the former Soviet Union or Brazil or India, those are all racially mixed populations. And when we have clinical trials done in those populations, is it right or are there problems, scientific problems, when we bring that information back and generalize it to an outbred U.S. population. I don't know the answer, but I think it merits investigation by the FDA. And I was at an FDA conference uh, probably three, four, five years ago where all the FDAs of the Americas, so this 
includes Latin America, the United States, Canada, all met to discuss this problem. Um, and I haven't seen much additional work on it. But is a, is a drug that's developed in Indian populations, is that generalizable to now? Okay. I think we lost you, and I think you cannot even hear me. Huh. Is that because of the timeout of the hour booked, or is it... Can you hear us? Okay, can you hear us now? I'm not sure what part you lost but there I think you can I'm, hear I'm you. sorry can hear you. I, can you hear I'm us? sorry um, I'm not sure what part we got cut off at um, the uh, concern that you have is if we outsource clinical trials uh, we get information that may not be applicable to a population that we have in the US and certainly that's something we are concerned about as well um, yeah uh, you know, it's just like when we did studies in men and generalize them to women. That's hence the, the reformulation of the Ambien. Um, I don't know the right answer, and I'm being candid, uh, but I think it merits further investigation. I agree. And certainly there is uh, the SERSI and the SERSI network and the collaborative efforts between academia and the FDA and NIH, certainly as... Uh, stakeholder alliance, if you want to call it that way, including patients and uh, patient interest group, but also the uh, entire uh, ecosystem that, of course, includes drug developers and, and drug makers. I don't see additional uh, questions. Oh, please. It probably is best you use this. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Hi. I uh, uh, hope, you, hope you're enjoying uh, the, the, the rain in California. Um, oh, love it. Thank you. I think you need more. Uh, thank you for the uh, very nice lecture. Uh, you uh, uh, concentrated, of course, on responsiveness, uh, responsiveness to albuterol in, in uh, multiple uh, uh, populations of kids with, with uh, as you indicated, a, a large variety of uh, severity of asthma. Um, have you extended this to, uh, since, since asthma is treated with a multiplicity of medicines, have you extended this to responsiveness to inhaled steroids or leukotriene agents? Uh, uh, or why, just fixate, why just fixate on albuterol? I'm sure these, many of these kids are on multiple uh, treatments. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, the, the one of the reasons why we focused in on albuterol is because that is the number one drug by far worldwide for all kids with asthma. If you look at the cost of Advir, which is a combination of Cerebin and Flovin or a long-acting beta agonist and a long-acting inhaled corticosteroid, that could be anywhere from $250 to $400 a month. When, when I teach in the School of Pharmacy, I went and bought, uh, you know, a regular albuterol inhaler at my CVS, and I could have gone to my clinic. I just needed it the day before. It cost me $60. So the problem with the, many of the new drugs, and I worry about it, is that they're going to be fiscally, financially prohibited for the majority of patients, and that's why I wanted to focus in on albuterol. And studies demonstrate that Amongst poor individuals in the United States, 80% rely on albuterol as their only medication. And believe me, you know, um, the Plavix one is very concerning. And um, I have the benefit of teaching 122 PharmD students every spring. I'm starting March 29th. And one of the things that we did is we actually did genetic testing of all the students who were 
many of the genes that were involved in drug metabolism, so like CYP2C19, and and the 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 allele frequency of the null allele in my class is as high as seventy percent, and that means Plavix won't work for those kids. I call them kids. I'm sure they're like twenty six or twenty seven, but it also means that it won't work in their parents. And, and, and this is the problem. And what you saw with the Bristol-Myers Squibb approach is that they don't care. You know, they're kind of like taking the Donald Trump approach. Sue me and I'll pay for the, the legal fees. You know, good luck suing Bristol-Myers Squibb. And this is why we lended a hand to the Attorney General of Hawaii. And what we demonstrated with the Hawaii case will really bother you as a U.S. citizen. When we looked at cardiovascular death rates amongst Hawaiians before and after the marketing of Plavix, cardiovascular death rates remained flat for Caucasians, but they went up markedly for Asians. And I understand that these are epidemiologic numbers, but on an individual level, whether it's you, me, your parents, my parents, if that were to happen and you knew that a, your parent was being treated with a placebo, it would make you upset. And this is where um, I try to be a basic scientist, but you cannot neglect the epidemiologic observations and have some sense of social activism that motivates each one of us to pursue our careers. Sorry. <laughs> I'm very passionate about this. I see this. I was going to ask you, isn't our black box warning about uh, CYP2, C19, and, and the not responding, you, you think that it, we're, we're just not effective communicators is what, uh, is what it appears to be, that if they're still using it in Hawaii to treat non-responders, well, that's something that should be tested. Uh, You're right. You're right. And, and there was a nice editorial, and I, I, maybe Lawrence Lynn can send it out to you guys, that talked about... Um, the healthcare providers, whether they be physicians or PharmDs, not willing to incorporate new advances into their clinical decision making. And Bristol Myers Squibb is counting on that. And, and that's why in my class, we, we, I got frustrated with trying to treat, teach um, old dogs new tricks, meaning the physicians and current pharmacists. And so, we are starting with all first-year PharmD students to teach them uh, genetics, pharmacogenetics. We do role-playing where they can act like the pharmacist and talk to the patient and so forth. It's going to need a sea change that is started by you as the FDA, that is started by us as healthcare providers and healthcare, edu healthcare educators. I recognize that we have a challenge, but we have to do something. We can't accept the status quo. Thank you. We have two questions from um, the remote viewers. One is asking how much of nature made the difference. For example, smoking. Oh, smoking. Nurture. Sorry, I need glasses. Um, how much of nurture made the difference? For example, smoking in the family environment, diet, etc. It's a huge risk factor. I think that poverty is the biggest determinant of health outcomes, and that's. Unfortunately, uh, it's not something that's easy to fix. Um, I think we, being scientists, the FDA and me and so forth, um, we can focus our attention on helping to improve healthcare by better understanding different pathologic or biologic and pathologic mechanisms. I agree that you know we shouldn't study the genetics of emphysema because we should just put that money into public health cessation of tobacco smoke. Um, you're right. Uh, there's not, not a lot we could do about that. And poverty, you know, the biggest predictor of you dying as a black male is being black. It has nothing to do with your genetics. It just happens what, what happens in our society. And you, you're seeing that with Ferguson and so forth. And um, but I'm a basic scientist, and I got to focus. I focus in on what we can do, not what I can't do. On the flip side, I have to be worried about what people will do with this knowledge. And so, um, uh, you heard about David Duke in the in the press recently uh, with Donald Trump. 
in 2003 when we published our paper in the New England Journal about racial differences in genetics, Donald Trump uh, called me on my cell phone. I don't know how he got my cell phone, but he called me and basically said, you know, you're validating my, what, what I believe and what's on my website. And so, you know, there are going to be people out there that will distort the science to their benefit. And we can't worry about that. I could focus on what we can't worry about. Thank you. Uh, the last question, could you speak to whether you've determined whether it's the drug causing death or is it the genomic background that determines the ultimate outcome? Have your methods allowed a conclusion on ca 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 sure. causality? Sure. Causality. Yeah. Well, we've demonstrated pretty clearly that there are individuals within our study populations that have inherent resistance to the drug. Other studies that are going on now have demonstrated that African Americans have an element of steroid resistance. There's an ongoing NIH-funded clinical trial called BAR uh, to enroll African Americans to determine what are the additional drugs that they need, African Americans with asthma, to determine what are the additional drugs they need to overcome this element of steroid resistance. But as you saw with my slide showing 95% of all research in the last 20 years by the NIH for lung disease is focusing on European populations, we won't identify these pathways unless we have inclusion of diverse populations in clinical and biomedical research. It goes back to the days when we made those cardiovascular recommendations based on all white guys and generalized them to women. And I can tell you as a physician, women present differently clinically when they have a heart attack than men do. So the guidelines don't work. And fortunately, Reagan started the Women's Health Initiative that finally got, number one, female scientists involved in designing clinical trials, and number two, doubled, tripled, and quadrupled the enrollment of women in cardiovascular studies. So now we're finding new guidelines for heart disease that are for men and for women. And that's, that's a, to me, that's a no-brainer, but it's true for other racial groups as well with respect to drug response. Thank you. Thanks. It's oh. been a wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. It was a fascinating talk. We so appreciate your time. My pleasure. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and, and send them to me. I can forward them to the doctor, and I will get everyone. We'll have the slides up also. Great. And we'll send you that editorial that came out yesterday regarding Bristol Myers Squibb dumping the Precision Medicine Initiative. Okay, thank you. I can send it to everyone, and we'll also have a recording of this up also. Thank you. Have a nice day.